Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Tabletop Tavern Tips. Today, we are back and talking about Baldur's Gate 3 again. It's been on the mind, okay? I finally actually got into the game a little bit later than most people, but still, hey, better late than never. And today, now that I know a little bit more about what's going on throughout the world of Baldur's Gate 3, I decided I'd take a look at the Baldur's Gate 3 subreddit. And lo and behold, what did I find? I found a hot takes and unpopular opinions threat, because of course I did. Though this one is a lot less unhinged than the Critical Role one we did a while back. So today, we're going to be talking about Baldur's Gate 3 hot takes and unpopular opinions to see what we can learn about game design and maybe what we can learn about D&D. Though, of course, Baldur's Gate is a different medium, so who knows what we're going to pull out of this. Now, I will say at the top, I'm going to keep things as vague as possible when it comes to story spoilers, but there will be possible spoilers for Baldur's Gate 3, Acts 2, and 3. I don't think it's going to be anything intense. I'm going to keep things as vague as possible, but names and vague information will come up, so you have been warned. Without further ado, guys... Let's get started. Oh, starting this off with a fun one. Baldur's Gate 3 is not an incredible game. It's all right. Solid 7 out of 10. First, you spelled all right wrong. Second, I actually, this might surprise you, I actually agreed with this take maybe two weeks ago. I wouldn't put it as low as 7 out of 10, but... Baldur's Gate was not my game of the year a couple weeks ago, and still might not be today. Before I got to Act 2 and really dug into the game, I was in the Underdark portion, and I'm not gonna lie, I did not enjoy it that much. The Underdark really killed the momentum of this game for me. I understand why people really enjoyed that section, I understand why people recommend it, but I took the internet's recommendation to go through the Underdark in order to get to the Shadow Curse lands. It was very tedious and didn't have a lot of direction, which I think is good, but every direction I did end up going into had some tedious activity I didn't want to do. Like, for example, I found this Mage's Tower thing that had this really stupid auto turret puzzle that I just... Ugh, I could not be bothered to do. I understand that might be a problem with me rather than with the game, but overall, I just was not vibing with it. Once I got to Act 2, though, I was really, really enjoying myself. I finally got companions to open up, I was really engaging in their stories, in their quests, and at that moment, I realized, like, okay, I get it. I understand what this game is about. I'm having a lot more fun. Again, I don't think I'd ever say Baldur's Gate is a 7 out of 10 game. I mean, Act 1 is really, really strong. Arguably the strongest portion of the game for a lot of people. But, yeah, I did not say this was my favorite game of the year. Now, it's contended. This game versus Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, it's going to be a close race for me personally, and at the end of the day, it's going to come up with a preference. I'm not a huge CRPG guy. This is my first one I ever really dug into, but hey, who knows? The point is, I disagree with this take, even as a guy who did agree a couple weeks ago. There's not enough going on at camp. I wish there would be banter around a bonfire with everyone like in Red Dead Redemption 2. I love just sitting in on people's conversations. The camps always seem like little spots for gathering, but nobody ever gathers. Hard agree on this one. This is my biggest critique with the game. If you're unaware, there is a lot of data mind dialogue between the companions that's supposed to play whenever you're just walking around. And this is really cool. So my favorite parts of games like Mass Effect or Dragon Dragon Age Inquisition, where I'm just walking around and companions have little pieces of banter that really builds up their character. And there's tons of that dialogue in the files, but man, you wouldn't know if you just played the game, because God, it never plays. Like, when I'm playing Baldur's Gate, I think I've heard maybe nine pieces of dialogue in my 30-some hours of playtime. And considering that there is over, like, an hour and a half of dialogue that I've heard on just YouTube, that is a really paltry sum. Keep in mind, when I'm hearing the dialogue on YouTube, it's not people recording it in gameplay, it's people usually just taking it out of the game data, because almost no one hears this stuff. Even when I do hear it, it's bugged out. Sometimes only half the conversation will play, which is just really disappointing. I think having the dialogue play in camp would be a good solution to this. Like this guy said, Red Dead Redemption 2 is a great example of this, where companions in that game are constantly talking to each other and building up their characters. It also makes the camp feel more alive because the camp in general just feels dead. I know people can talk in camp. I've seen side NPCs talk in camp, so I don't know why our companions can't walk around and share conversations. Also, another small camp critique, why in the heck are the companions not showing the mini map with their portraits at all times? 
Seriously, only your party members are shown on the minimap with their portraits, meaning it's a pain in the butt to find people in camp if you're wanting to talk to a specific person sometimes. All of their portraits should be showing at all times. I don't see why this isn't already a feature. In your D&D games, while you can't take most of this advice and apply it to D&D because, you know, different medium, the advice of fostering camp talks is a good one. If you're a dungeon master, prompting player characters to roleplay during long rests or during watches is a great way to bring nervous role players out of their shell. It's kind of hard for them to sometimes just jump into roleplaying, but in my experience, while in camp, my players are much more relaxed when it comes to roleplaying. I once had an NPC walk up to a party member while he's taking a solo watch, and they had a short conversation about their backstories, and it was a really, really great moment. Baldur's Gate 3 is not a great example of interaction in the campsite, but hey, take this critique and apply it to your own D&D game, and hey, you might be able to pull some roleplay out of your players. We didn't have enough scenes with the villains. Both J.K. Simmons and Jason Isaacs were criminally underused as Kethrick Thorne and Envar Gortash. So, agree, but unlike the camp thing, I completely understand why this is the case. Both Jason Isaacs and J.K. Simmons are really big actors, and the time commitment to do something like Baldur's Gate is probably not possible for either of them. This is something that a lot of video games experience, especially live service games like Destiny. Famously, Cade Six, a major character in that franchise, was voiced by Nathan Fillion, and Nathan Fillion was Cade Six. For all intents and purposes, he was that character and played him very, very well. People loved Nathan Fillion as the famous hunter vanguard, and during the Forsaken expansion, Cade Six met his demise, but Nathan Fillion was not there to voice him. Unfortunately, scheduling constraints meant that Nathan Fillion could not voice Cade during arguably his most iconic moment, his final stand against Aldrin Sov and the Scorn Barons. And yeah, that sucked. It sucked a lot, but that's just kind of how things are in the industry. It's unfortunate that scheduling problems likely meant that Envar Gortash and Ketherick Thorm were unable to have more lines due to their actors simply being unavailable. I, however, see the positives of this. The fact of the matter is that Jason Isaacs and J.K. Simmons did give incredible performances, especially Jason Isaacs. His work as one of the main villains of the game was incredible, and even if I wish we had more of him, I'm just glad we didn't get a phoned-in performance. I have seen so many big Hollywood actors put in phoned-in performances for video games. That blade's enchanted. Huh? And I'm glad we did not get that here. We got two incredible actors playing these characters to the best of their abilities, and it was great. In terms of D&D lessons that you could take from this, obviously you're not hiring voice actors for your characters, but you yourself as a dungeon master are likely voicing the villains. It is unfortunate that J.K. Simmons and Jason Isaacs, their characters, could not be in the story more, but you don't have that limitation. You can include your villains as much as you want. While you shouldn't overdo it, having your villains be an active part of the story is a great way to build their character further and foster that hatred between the the party and the villain. Ketherick Thorm in particular has some family stuff in the game and it is a very underdeveloped part of the story I have to say. It was very disappointing for me as a player when I realized all the opportunities that could have been. But like I said before, you don't have those limitations. You can include your party's favorite bad guys as much as you need to to fully flesh out their stories. Take inspiration from this to build your villains into even better characters for your party to hate or love to hate. The camera blows. Worst part of the entire game. I know that every single one of us has tried to go up a flight of stairs only to have the camera stop and we accidentally click through the stairs and on the floor below, sending the characters back down the way they came. I don't know if this is a typical thing with CRPGs. I don't play a lot of them, but yeah. The ability for the camera to just really mess you up and inconvenience you is actually quite impressive, especially indoors. For me, it's not stairs. For me, it's doors. The amount of times I've clicked on a door to get through the door, clicked on space through the door, but accidentally closed the door, then I need to open the door again, then I need to zoom in the camera to find a way to get through the damn door so my character doesn't close it again. It is, mm, it is very, very annoying. Overall, it's not the worst thing ever. It's not enough to bump this game down points-wise or anything like that, but it is an annoyance. Unfortunately, there's not many D&D lessons to take from this. I will say that I disagree with the camera being the worst part of the game. For me, the worst part of the game was the autosave being extremely stingy. For example, I know Bloodborne has save points as part of the difficulty of that video game. Alien Isolation has save points as part of the difficulty of that video game. That's integrated into the game design. Here, it just feels like an inconvenience, not like an intentional part of the design. If you're unaware or haven't played Baldur's Gate 3 yet, seriously, quick saving is almost a necessary thing. You need to be constantly opening up your menu to hit the save button so you don't lose tons of progress on the unexpected death, or you don't lose tons of progress when you accidentally hit the load button. But the amount of times I've accidentally hit the load button 
was twice. And I lost two hours of progress both times. And both times, I was legitimately pissed. So mad, in fact, I turned off the game. That was very annoying. If the autosave was less stingy, though, this wouldn't be a problem. I don't know why we have Skyrim-style autosave in this game. Skyrim came out in 2011, for God's sakes. Actually, I take that back. Even Skyrim saved your dang game whenever you entered a new room. Whereas this game, I feel like saves the game at just the most random point. Like, I'll complete some long quest line to save the tieflings, and just nothing happens, and I accidentally hit the load button, and I have to reset all the way back to the beginning of that quest line, losing two hours of progress. Yeah, I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> what can I say? But yeah, that's, in my opinion, the worst part of this game. You might have a different opinion. I'm not trying to rustle any feathers here. Again, I really like Baldur's Gate 3, but hey, nothing is perfect, including this game. Whether it's the camera, or whether it's the autosave, it's not a perfect game. And you know what? That's okay. Frankly, with the amount of stuff that just goes wrong game development, it's a miracle any game is good. Shadowheart is cringe. Right away, after releasing her from the Mind Flayer pod, I knew she was going to have a particular type of attitude when she referred to it as my pod, as if she's been sharing a cell with an inmate for 10 years with 20 more to go. I figured she'd just be a hot topic edgelord desperate to get the manager's job, and that's exactly what she is rolls eyes. If you're unaware, I am a big fan of Shadowheart. She is the only and first video game romance I have ever done. And so, obviously, I like her character and don't find her cringe. But I actually would understand if somebody dislikes Shadowheart. She definitely is a particular type of character, and I understand why someone wouldn't like that type of character. She can be very abrasive at times. However, this is a really stupid reason to hate a character. What's she supposed to call the pod? Like, is she just supposed to call it, like, the pod? Or, or releasing me from a pod? Like, my pod. That makes sense. If I'm at a hotel, it doesn't matter if I've only been there for a day. I'm gonna call it my hotel room, right? If she called the ship as a whole my nautiloid, then yeah, I'd find that kind of weird. But my pod? Yeah, what, what else is she supposed to call it? This just seems like a really silly reason to hate a character. Also, like, what a surface level analysis of who Shadowheart is. Oh my god, this is just very strange, especially since Shadowheart doesn't, spoiler alert, she doesn't need to be a Char servant if you don't want her to be. You can convince her to be something else if you want to. So yeah, it's a, it's a really weird analysis of Shadowheart's character, like somebody who went to the game with a preconceived notion of what they'd like and what they wouldn't like, and just kind of bent everything to fit that preconceived notion because seriously hating a character over the way she refers to a very specific part of the story seems weird weird to say the least it is kind of dismaying that i'm in love with someone yet we wake up in different beds or in different rooms while we're in the tavern waking up side by side felt cute and immersive and those two words your companion said waking up were really nice I never really thought of that, but you know, this person is right. I've never played Fallout 4, but I knew that was a feature, and I found it cool there, and it would be cool if it was in Baldur's Gate 3. With all the detail that went into the creation of this game, I'm surprised it isn't a native feature, especially since the camp as is feels so dead, like we said before. So waking up next to your companion would be a good way to increase that immersion just that little bit, especially since there's a dedicated cutscene whenever you take a long rest. I'm surprised there's not an animation for your companion sleeping next to your character. It doesn't need to be anything NSFW. I know people are going to make stupid jokes in the comments, but yeah, like this person said, it's cute and immersive. It builds up that relationship, especially since this might be another hot take that I'm going to deliver. I think the romantic content of this game is honestly kind of on the light end. It's a big part of the reason why I think the main character should have been voice acted. I understand why they're not. It would have been an insane amount of work. But I do think the romantic angle of this game suffers because the main character doesn't have a voice when you're talking to your romantic interest. The romance content of this game boils down to only a handful of scenes and maybe some parts of dialogue, which really surprised me considering how much people hyped up the NSFW romance parts of this game, the horniest RPG ever really isn't, to say the least. It isn't even comparable to something like Dragon Age or Mass Effect, where I feel like Commander Shepard and his love interest, or their love interest, sorry, I play as a guy, Shepard, Commander Shepard and their love interest have a variety of scenes, much more dialogue, and overall many more moments to flesh out those relationships and moments. I'm not trying to say the romances in Baldur's Gate are bad, by the way. They're not. They're really, really good. I was just surprised that they're not more in-depth, and I think having you wake up next to your romantic interest, I think that would help to build up that romantic depth all the more. But, hey, they seem to be continually updating the game, so maybe in the future this could be a feature. Larian. 
take it down, credit me, or credit this Reddit user. It's a good idea. Making all romanceable characters bisexual is a lazy choice and quite ruins the immersion. Hmm. Stop it. I'm not dressed as L this time. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so I actually do kind of agree, but that kind of is doing a lot of heavy lifting. I don't want the way the game is right now to change. I like that everyone has the option to romance everyone. I get why that's a big plus for a lot of people. It would suck to be locked out of certain romances because you played the wrong gender of character. But at the same time, I will say that I am not the kind of DM who will retroactively change a character's sexual orientation to match a player character if they're interested in a romance. I will have that NPC let them down easy, even if their sexual orientation was not pre-established. The first example that comes to mind is Kalia Solfero from Shadow Over Karakonos, who is an NPC I talk about a lot because she represents a lot of tropes that would typically be RPG horror stories, but here we're going to talk about something else. She is a lesbian character. She is gay. And a male player character expressed a little bit of interest in some sort of blooming romantic subplot, and I told him, no, she wouldn't be interested in the man. She is gay. I had already set that up in my head, and I wasn't going to change it. I didn't want to change the establishment of the character. And that's just the kind of dungeon master that I am. So, I don't know if I'd want to apply that to Baldur's Gate 3. Obviously, again, different medium, and I'm not playing for my players. This is a game that goes out to a lot of people. However, on the video game side, I like it when Dragon Age Inquisition has characters let you down easy if your gender does not match their sexual orientation. Those scenes, in my opinion, are really, really cool. It shows a degree of maturity in these characters, a mutual respect. They're never dramatic or bitter, at least in my experience. They're mostly just characters letting you down easy and just saying, I want to be just friends. It's funny too, because in Baldur's Gate 3, when a character lets you down easy, they don't let you down easy. They freaking roast the actual hell out of you. So it's interesting that they decided to go with this option. But on the other hand, I get it. I like that the characters are all open to whatever romantic options so that people can pursue their romances and have their own head. BG3 is all about creating your own story, it's just like Dungeons and Dragons, and I think this is one way that Larian was trying to do that. I do like when characters have established sexual orientations, and even when they let down a player character easy, but I also agree that Larian should keep the game the way it is. I don't mind the way the game is right now when it comes to romanceable NPCs. This is the most my asexual ass has ever talked about romance other than RPG horror stories. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. This is definitely less of a Dungeons and Dragons video, more of a video game video. Hope you guys don't mind me changing things up a little bit. Next week, we will be returning to D&D though. I'm hoping to film my in-costume Halloween episode. We always do one of these every year. Last year, I was L from Death Note. The year prior to that, I was Dutch Vanderlyn from Red Dead Redemption 2. I have a costume ready for this year as well. If you have any guests, as to who I'm dressing up as, leave them down in the comments down below. And hey, I guess we're doing the comment thing at the beginning, but we'll do the other things too. If you guys enjoyed this video, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out the aforementioned RPG Horror Story series. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content right as it comes out. I already talked about comments, but if you have any comments, leave them down in the comment section down below. If you can't think of a comment, you can guess what my costume will be this week. I know I already talked about comments, but hey, if you have any tips or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't leave a comment, like I said, you can guess what my Halloween costume will be this year. But hey, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.